Just ahead on American Black Journal, local churches join in the effort to raise awareness about the number one cause of death in African American women. We'll talk about the alarming rate of heart disease in the black community. Plus, there's a movement underway to encourage young girls of color to love the skin they're in. We'll talk with one of the founders of Pretty Brown Girl. That's all coming up next, so stay with us. Eric wants to know, what does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint-by-number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy. Know your own power. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. February is American Heart Month, and the churches in Detroit are helping to spread the word about the devastating impact of heart disease in the black community. Just listen to these statistics. Heart disease is the number one killer of African American women. Nearly 50% of black women ages 20 and older have heart disease, and only 52% of African American women know the symptoms of a heart attack. Here to talk about the efforts to raise awareness of heart disease are Christian Hurley from the South East Michigan American Heart Association and Dr. Alexia Norwood from Henry Ford Medical Center in Troy. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thanks so much for having me. You know those Thank numbers you. I was talking about there are very very stunning and I think equally stunning is the idea that these are numbers about women. I think when we think about heart disease in the black community we almost sort of reflexively think about men yes. uh, but it's obviously according to those numbers just as big a problem for women. Actually, more women are uh, more uh, of a problem, right? Yes, are losing their lives to uh, heart disease uh, currently. Uh, one of the problems that we're facing in the African American community is an issue of awareness, uh, particularly amongst African American women. Uh, we know that only 43 percent of African American women consider heart disease as a as as their greatest heart you know heart greatest threat. Yeah. Uh, in comparison to 60 percent of of white women, so we have quite a gap just in the idea that you know black women. Just aren't thinking they about. They aren't thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Now, is that in part because uh, historically we've sort of paid so much attention to the fact that you know heart disease is a big killer. I mean, we don't want to downplay that. It is a big killer among African American men too, more than it is among uh, other ethnic groups. Uh, certainly, I, I, I'm sure that that's a, a part of it, and I'm sure that Dr. Norwood could speak to that even more. Mm -hmm. But I think too that. I think one of the things in the African American community is we have more fear of cancer right. than we do I of see. heart disease. Than heart disease. Um, when in fact that's just uh, also something that is an issue of awareness. When we lose about one in thirty people right. to say breast cancer, right. and one in three people to heart disease. Right. So um, it's just an issue of getting people to understand that. Um, you know, heart disease is a major problem in our community, and we need to start paying attention. Right. Uh, when I was important. citing those statistics, the one that jumped out to me more than anything was the number of people who, uh, who wouldn't know what the symptoms of a heart attack are. And I guess I'm not sure I would know what that is. I mean, I, if you sit and think about it, uh, what what would that what would that be? Well, since 1984, more women than men have died of of heart, disease. of heart disease. Since 1984, women outnumber men. So that's when I graduated from, from college. Right. So that's a, a, a while that women have outnumbered men in terms of death of heart disease. Uh -huh. And we know that, unfortunately, it's been considered a men's disease because men very often have heart disease prior to women do in terms of age. Most okay. men develop heart disease in their 40s. Women tend to get heart disease more so after menopause. So it's always considered to be killing the, the males when they were very productive mm -hmm. and occurring more in women later. Right. The, the signs and symptoms of heart disease are very common for both men and women. The most common symptom is chest pain or chest discomfort. Sure. But heart disease in women can present very differently. So for some women, it's feeling just tired, having a shortness of breath, sometimes having neck pain or arm pain, 
pain going up the neck, feeling sweaty. And for some women, it's just feeling uneasy and they can't quite put their finger on what the cause is. And it's just a sense of not being at their norm. Right. And so how do you, how do you uh, combat that? I mean, is, is it uh, something that doctors normally look for uh, in, in younger African-American women and would say, hey, uh, these things that you're feeling could be a sign of of heart disease. Right, so one is looking at the symptoms and the second is actually looking at the risk factors. Mm -hmm. So we know that 90% of people with heart disease have at least one risk factor. And believe it or not, for African American women, one study in Yale actually showed that probably a good 40% of African American women have more than three risk factors. More than three. Okay. And we know that the more risk factors you have, the more risk of heart disease. Right, and there is what, what are some of those risks? I mean, I can probably yes. imagine yes. diet. Yes, I'll uh, tell you the top five. Smoking. Top, uh, yes. So the top five are high blood pressure, number okay. one. The number one risk factor for heart disease is high blood pressure, and that's very prevalent in the African-American sure. community. Diabetes, high cholesterol, being overweight, and being a smoker. Those are like the top five risk factors. And we also know that having a family history of heart disease is a risk is factor as well. It's one of the things that, uh, so tell me some more about uh, American Heart Month. What does that, what does that mean? So during American Heart Month, the American Heart Association takes this opportunity to really raise awareness around all of these one of all of these things that Dr. Norwood is talking about. We can't do much about our, our family history, but we can do something about our rate of hypertension, you know, our high blood pressure. We can yes. do something about the level of physical activity that we're getting right. into our day. We can do something about um, you know our our obesity rates. These are all things we have control over. So it's really a movement amongst uh, women, particularly, to really raise awareness of this issue in our community and to tell, tell women what they can be doing to lower their risk factor. Yeah. Um, particu particularly in the African American community, uh, what we're doing right now is something called Have Faith in Heart uh, Sundays. So we are working with This is our, where the churches come in. Yes. Yeah. So we're working with our churches in the black community, which have historically have been kind of a a uh, melting pot of our community and a, a source of information and a trusted place. So Churches are taking the opportunity on one Sunday during the month of February to raise awareness of this issue. The right. pastors are talking about it from the pulpit. Uh, folks are having uh, heart healthy, they're bringing in heart healthy dishes and having a little bit of a potluck. They're distributing uh, heart healthy recipes. They're, they might have a heart disease survivor speak during service. Right. Uh, everyone will come in wearing red. So just an opportunity to uh, really raise awareness in your church. And if you think about it, one church, you know, doing this across, you know, the whole community. We have over 30 churches participating. Sure. That's reaching more than reach 5,000 people. people. Yeah. Um, so just taking that one Sunday, even if you're a very small church, uh, because the more churches that do it, the more raise awareness that we're able to get out into the community. So yeah. that's one of the things that we've been doing, uh, just to raise our, our thoughts on this issue and help people to know that they do have control over some of these risk factors. Right, right. And when we talk about uh, uh, treating heart disease. I mean, it's, it's, you're never cured of heart disease per se, right? I mean, uh, it's a matter of managing it, right? Right, so, so there are things you can do. Heart disease is 100% preventable. Preventable in the first place, in the, I see. In the beginning, it's 100% okay. preventable. So the way we prevent heart disease is to dec decrease the risk of things that cause heart disease. So we know in Michigan, unfortunately, we're in the, the, um, in, in the Midwest where winter activities uh, tend to be very low. Yeah. The less leisure activity you have, you increase your risk of heart disease. Right. So one thing that we found, unfortunately, as well with those studies is that African-American women are the group that have the least amount of activity. African men have more physical activity than women tend to have. African women, African American females have less. And, and Caucasian females have more. And even Hispanic females have more physical activity than African American females do. So physical activity increases your, decreases your risk of heart disease. So we need to all move. Right. And it also showed in one study, a Minnesota study, that it didn't, even if you did some activity, not an hour, not 40 minutes, mm -hmm. some physical activity. Something during the day. Something during the day where you're moving is better than nothing. Yeah. That that actually helps to decrease your risk. Right. So decreasing your risk in terms of moving more and definitely with your diet. We know that Avoiding, a high salt diet. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm thinking that diet has gotta be. Yes. Just, uh, 
a real cardinal sign there, right? A major, major factor in the uh, African American community is a high salt diet. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the recommendation is that we decrease the sodium intake, 15, 1800 milligrams of salt per day, which is kind of hard to try to quantitate, yeah. but and you know. That's, I mean, I think that's part of the tough uh, thing with that is how do you know how much salt yes. you're, you're, you're consuming, especially if you're eating processed foods, which, you know. Which are very high in sodium. Very high in sodium. So, so I think simple. You know, it's the simpler, the better for me. So for me, I say, uh, you know, you can read the labels. That's one way. Well, right. But stay away from foods that are processed foods as much as possible. Fast foods fresh as food. much as possible. Mm -hmm. And eat fresh foods, mm -hmm. right? So your fresh, fru fresh fruits and vegetables, ideally more than that's your uh, best, uh, That's your best bet. Yes. Because mm -hmm. the processed foods really is where people are getting their, the, the majority of their sodium, of their sodium intake. Mm -hmm. And we, I deal with folks all the time, and they say, you know, I don't put salt on my food when I yeah. eat. You know, <laughs> I don't even have a salt shaker on my table, but they're not thinking about the fact that there's quite a bit of, of salt in bread. Right. You know, you're having your toast in the morning and you're yes. having sodium. You know, and there's the salt number in one, the bread, right. The, the number one food item in the country that was determined last year to be the highest sodium intake for the country mm -hmm. is bread. It's bread. Because not that potato chips don't have more salt, right. but we eat more bread in the American diet than we do potato chips. Okay. Bread for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and right. snacks. Not so to um, the lunch meat. Yes. Another place where lunch you're going to be getting. Sure. So you think you're on a diet and you're doing well. You're having your turkey sandwich for lunch. And, <laughs> yes. You know, and you, but you haven't paid attention to how much. How much sodium, sodium is, is in, in that bread and the mm -hmm. lunch meat. So mm -hmm. these are the kinds of things people just need to be aware of. Um, it's not just from the salt shaker that it's you're not. getting that sodium, and right. that is something that is very impactful on your blood pressure. Right. Which we've which already is talked one about. Of the number one risk factor. Number right. one risk factor yeah. for mm -hmm. heart disease. You know, and stroke. You know, yeah. which is yeah. another yes. major issue sure. in the African. American we got like two minutes uh, left. I, I would think that the number one thing that that, that uh, you, you need to stress here, or would want to stress here, is you've got to you've got to know about this stuff. You can't guess. You have to go to the doctor, and not just uh, when you feel badly. You got to go regularly, and that's how we pick up on all of these mm -hmm. these different factors. Heart disease is 100% pre preventable. The way we prevent it is to decrease our risk factors, and you don't know what your numbers are if you never if you check. Don't go. So you need to see your doctor and have your numbers checked. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, I mean, that's an issue in the community as well, is at, with access uh, and with education, getting people to, to be able to do that. Yes. We'll take advantage, too, of some of the local programs out there. For example, when we go out, we have a hypertension program right now in the community, and we do free screenings from time to time. So, you know, utilize the American Heart Association as one of your resources. Reach out to those community groups that you might be aware of that are doing screenings. We work with groups all the time that right. have health fairs and, and have these free screenings. So folks should take advantage of those right. and go out and have the opportunity to get those numbers. And checked. even if you don't have a primary care physician, which, you know, I mean, yes. we're working on that, right, with the, yes. <laughs> with the health reform Affordable. law. Mm -hmm. uh, Healthcare but, help but you know, you, there's still resources available. Even if you don't have one, you can get to, mm -hmm. to someone who can help. There, there are federally qualified health centers all across mm -hmm. Michigan where free health care is available. Mm -hmm. The CHAS Clinic is another one. And CHAS quite a and few, Southwest. Yeah. CHAS and Southwest yeah. uh, Detroit. So we have quite a few free health agencies that are available for our citizens. Right. So no excuses. You no gotta excuses. you got to get to the doctor. you got to get this stuff looked at. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Great to have you guys here. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Just ahead on American Black Journal, we'll tell you about a movement that encourages girls of color to dream big and embrace their pretty brown skin. That's coming up next, right after this look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African American life in Detroit. This week in 1972, the Michigan Chronicle reported that Marie Farrell Donaldson had become the first black female certified public accountant. In 1956, Prophet Jones, the flamboyant and flashy religious leader, was arrested by Detroit police and charged with gross indecency. And in 1964, Marvin Gaye and Little Stevie Wonder squared off in the first Motown Records Battle of the Stars concert at the Greystone Ballroom. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book, On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. On February 22nd, girls of color all over the world will celebrate Pretty Brown Girl Day. It's a day dedicated to promoting their beauty both inside and out. The Pretty Brown Girl movement celebrates all shades of brown skin while boosting the confidence and self-esteem of girls and young women. The founders live here in Detroit and I'm pleased to have one of them here today on American Black Journal. 
Corey Crawley. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Stephen. So this is uh, a, a conversation that seems like we've been having in this country for decades, right? Absolutely. Maybe centuries. Uh, the the, the self-consciousness uh, of African-American people about their skin color, and that, that visits particularly harshly on black, black women. Absolutely, because yeah. uh, girls, you know, uh, of course, they, they're, they're the main ones when it comes to the image, how they look. Um, and so what standard of beauty, which is established in this country, right. uh, we need to reinforce that with more positive messages, more positive images. And that's one of the things my wife and I wanted to do, uh, especially having two beautiful girls at home. Uh -huh. uh, I wanted to reinforce how beautiful they are inside and out, but also to inspire them to dream big right. and develop leadership skills as well. Right. Uh, you talk about that standard of beauty. I mean, there's that famous uh, study that was conducted where uh, they, and I, I won't remember what year this was. 1942. Uh, 1942, yes. where they asked black girls about uh, different dolls of different uh, skin colors, and they found that, that just like uh, their white counterparts, they identified the, the 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 white dolls with good things and the black the darker dolls with with bad things as you said that's 1942 we're almost 70 years uh, well we're more than 70 years uh, past that uh, has that standard of beauty changed significantly over there I mean we see far more people of color uh, sort of exalted as being beautiful uh, in media so so have we moved anywhere beyond the point where black children don't don't feel that way? Unfortunately, we haven't, and that's interesting you said that. Yeah. That was one of the things that uh, encouraged us to start this movement uh, with our daughters. Uh, we started basically living in Chicago at the time, mm -hmm. and my wife decided to celebrate my youngest daughter, uh, Aaliyah, when she was turning four, uh, at a popular doll store downtown Chicago. Uh -huh. They invited beautiful black girls to this party, and they get an opportunity to pick a doll with before they eat lunch. Uh -huh. And all the beautiful girls picked white dolls. They picked white dolls. They picked white dolls, even my daughters. Yeah. And my wife was... She said, what's wrong with the Pretty Brown Girl doll? And they said, this is the one we want. Right. Because that's the one that's been commercialized. That's the one that's in mainstream media, things yeah. of that nature. Right. And the second thing happened, we relocated from Chicago back to the Detroit area. Uh, we moved to a, a suburb, and my daughter, Layla, was the only African-American in her class at the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. in kindergarten. She was just smart, very sprite and very smart. Uh, but two months went by, and she saw a Pantene commercial on TV and asked, Mommy, can you buy me that shampoo to make my hair look like Kaylee? Oh, our classmate. Really? Said, oh, it's happening. And then ironically, uh, there was a news station that reconducted the Dow test. Right. And after seeing the young uh, African-American girl who was six years old, and she was asked which one she thought was the pretty one, which one she thought was the, the ugly one, and every negative connotation was toward the, the, the darker. Was toward the darker The, the doll. black doll, yeah. yes. Yeah. And then the commentator asked her, well, why don't you like your skin? And she said, because I think it's ugly. Yeah. And my wife and I were both in tears, and we said we have to do something. Well, we got to do something. We right. have to do something. Right. Uh, and so you guys have created a doll that uh, that is uh, brown skinned and available, uh, and and sort of combats the image that uh, that you have to have a white doll. Right. <laughs> to, to 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 play with. And so we we saw this bias toward white dolls with African American girls, and so we said let's manufacture a doll that let the girls know that they are pretty. Right. And it's pretty, and let's embrace our brown skin. And so we wanted to put the message on the actual doll. So when they play with the doll, they said, I'm playing with my pretty brown girl doll. And so now right. that's the message that they have to say and also internalize. And so we also have other products too when it comes to a t-shirt line, uh, backpacks, things of that nature. And so now when my daughters go out and they wear their pretty brown girl t-shirts and they wear their backpacks, other people other than mommy and daddy are calling them pretty brown girls because now they're just reading. Uh, reading and asking about uh, the phrase or the clothes or the doll. Absolutely. Yeah. And so when I, my daughters hear this phrase, uh, it, they internalize this they message. They start to think about it. And it makes them feel better about who they are and, ex right. and accept who they are. And so yeah. now Pretty Brown Girl is part of my daughter's vocabulary. Right. So when right. they describe with a little black girl, they say, oh, daddy, look at the Pretty Brown Girl over there. Right. And so imagine a whole new generation of girls growing up calling themselves Pretty Brown Girls. And because of our mission, which is to celebrate the shades of brown all over the world, now it doesn't matter whether you're light skin or dark skin, you have short hair, long hair, kinky hair, or straight hair. It doesn't matter because we're all Pretty Brown Girls. So it's a, it's a, it's a movement and it's about love. Right. Right. You know, it's interesting hearing you t uh, say it and describe it that way. Uh, it, you know, it seems it seems uh, almost like overkill that, that, that you have to call it pretty brown girl. Uh, it's it's so obvious. Uh, but but you're right. You have to do that to, to, to sort of change that cultural norm and change the way that that particularly young children 
sort of acculturate themselves and think about these things uh, and, and form those those ideas of beauty at really young ages. Absolutely, because there is such a mis underrepresentation of uh, girls of color in the media and in the toy industry. Sure. When, when young girls grow up in, in, in this country, especially African-American girls, and they don't see themselves in the magazines. And when they walk down the toy aisle in a store, they don't see themselves there. Right. Uh, when they look through uh, magazines and things of that nature, they don't see themselves. What does that produce? What is the message they're receiving? They receive that, I'm, I'm, I'm not worthy, there's something, I'm less than. There's something wrong. And so what happens to their self-esteem? Oh, something's wrong with me. And so we wanted to combat that message with something positive and put more positive messages, more positive images out there for our girls so that they can embrace the skin that they're in and feel good about themselves and so they can become productive and, uh, and just uh, utilize the God-given talents. Right, right. Uh, so uh, on Pretty Brown Girl Day, what, 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 what goes on? What are some of the, the ways that people celebrate that? Well, actually, this is our third annual International Pretty Brown Girl Day. Uh -huh. uh, what started with the doll turned into a movement. Now we have clubs, and, and moms were asking, well, how can my daughter join? Dads were asking, how can my daughter join? And we, divide, we decided to develop a club where girls can get together, celebrate themselves, do community service, uh, and in different events. And so with turning to our International Pretty Brown Girl Day, there's a big celebration here in Detroit, other cities throughout the country. Our club members will be holding different celebrations. But even when there's not uh, a club in your area, we suggest that moms, dads, uh, uncles take their nieces, their daughters, their granddaughters, and just maybe a spa day to come to the, to the museum and just celebrate themselves to have more positive um, self-value and right, self-worth. Right, uh, And this has become an international movement. It's not just here. It's not just here in America. That no. We have this, it's not just here in America that we have this problem, but you've also been able to bring this, this message to people. It's actually a global issue, and we actually have a club in Seoul, Korea, at a military base, and also in the Bahamas. Yeah. And so we're excited about that. We have over 85 clubs throughout the country, also on college campuses like Spelman. Uh -huh. They'll be doing a celebration this, uh, this February 22nd, University of Michigan, DePaul University as well. And so it's something that we look forward to and we're excited about and that it's growing and getting bigger and more and more girls are building themselves up with positive images and positive messages. Right. You know, when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s, I think it was harder to think of uh, uh, sort of uh, African-American women who were held up as sort of beauty icons uh, or, or uh, popular in, in popular media than it is now. I mean, I, I think uh, when I think about my own kids and who they relate to, they have a lot more choices, uh, uh, which sort of, again, makes it makes it hard to understand why this is not changing. Uh, things are changing slowly, of course, uh, in popular media, but but we still have the same issue with 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 the kids. What, what's it going to take to get to the point where that that's just not something that that we're worried about? Well, unfortunately, uh, in our community, we're inundated with different images that do not reflect our images. Us. Sure. And, and when young girls don't see themselves, they think uh, less of themselves. And so uh, we need to <clears throat> promote more positive messages, yeah. more positive images for our girls. And we think that just the affirmation of Pretty Brown Girl, uh, which we also have a pledge, and, and the girls take the pledge at each meeting and each uh, gathering, uh, we think with that message, it will embody them and actually encourage them to dream big and, and make more healthier choices and sure. remember they're beautiful inside and out yeah. and always believe in themselves. And so we think with just that message and the, the group dynamics of the clubs right. and also our after school programs that we have for schools as well too, that might, this might encourage a, a, right. a great change. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of someone like uh, Michelle Obama, yes. right? Uh, for my kids who are eight and 10, uh, President Obama is the first president they have any sort of recognition of, right? So for them, that's what a president is. It's a black man. For them, a first lady is a black woman and, you know, a, a black woman who who is herself, you know, very attractive and and uh, uh, and not not seen as as different. I wonder I wonder how much effect that kind of stuff will have uh, on them as they get older. Um, we think it was going to have a tremendous effect. Uh, my daughter's in the same situation. Yeah. She's the first president they actually recognize, and they feel good about seeing Sasha Malia in the White House, also uh, Michelle Obama. Right, right. Uh, and so we think this might affect a, a change in the, that, that, dynamic, that dynamic right now in regards to how they see themselves. So this is a great start, but there are so many girls. There's so in many other, direction. and there's so much, you know, media is so much wider, of course, yes. now even than what it was. When I was a kid, there was so much more of it, uh, and and not all of it is 
is diverse. Correct. And there's much more distractions than it is today than uh, that's we, right. when we were growing up. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the next step for a uh, pretty brown girl? Uh, you've got a whole day. <laughs> what, what's your next uh, big big move here? Well, what we like to see is uh, more schools actually implementing our after school program yeah. uh, to build self-esteem. Because I talk to a lot of principals and they say if, if a child has low self-esteem, education can happen. Right. And so we want to improve uh, academic achievement and also to reduce the infractions because when we see this subject of colorism, and that's the different shades uh, of yeah. Of dark skin Among versus light African Americans. Absolutely. Sure. But when we also look at just in the school environment, studies have shown that darker girls are three times more to get suspended than lighter yes. skin girls. Right. And so we want to counteract that yeah. uh, and, and, and provide more unity, produce, produce more unity within the classroom setting and also in the group setting as yeah. well. Okay. Well, that's a great, it's a great, uh, great idea, and I'm glad you came to see us. Thank you for having me. Yes. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about all of our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. Eric wants to know. What does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy, know your own power.